everyone out there in the YouTube multiverse. Rod here. Hey, do you ever find yourself questioning some of the rules in the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook? Well, today I'll be taking a look at five assumed and what the actual class abilities are concerning AD&D magic users and their spells. Now, without further ado, here we go. Before I get started, I want to say a special thank you to all my viewers out there. And if you're new to my channel, hey, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring that shopkeeper's bell. Yeah, you'll get all the notifications when I put on my new videos. Now, to everyone's cousin Tony, or good friend Bill, who invited you to your first session. Sorry guys, house rules get misinterpreted into other DM's games. It's just like free parking gets the pot and monopoly rule. It's not in the rules, but people defend it like it really is. And number one, to be a magic user, all you gotta do is put on that pointy star covered hat. I'm sorry, Mickey, this is not the Sorcerer's Apprentice. All right, 99% of all dungeon masters out there don't play out the schooling trials and tribulations of their player characters and start them out as level zero students. Now, this would take several solo sessions to cover per player, although it would be really interesting to play out the arduous studies of picking out a spell and with the headmaster watching things blow up in players face. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Two, magic users are plate-wearing, sword-wheeling, telekinetic battle mages. Now, because of books and blockbuster Hollywood movies, newcomers to D&D think this is the standard. Now, in all fairness to the game, for all of you who started playing with 5th edition, you know that you start out as a first-level fighter, and then change your class to advance as a magic user. Now, in 5th edition, this will allow you to cast spells and armor. But, our topic here is 1st edition. For there to be game balance, to have the ability of spell casting, you must give up armor and badass weapons. Now, I'm not saying a staff can't be badass. I'm just saying that you're limited to your choice of weaponry. Look at it as a test of one's ability to look at a situation as an opportunity rather than a bash and slash. Balance needs to be kept in check. If a player character could do everything, we'd be playing a game called Nerfed Out Superheroes, not D&D. Besides that, who needs armor anyway when you have badass low-level spells like Shield, which protects you against missiles, and Phantasmal Force? Uh, designed for deception, all at your disposal. Three, you can cast a spell as many times as you want, as long as you have the mana to support it. This has caused many a problem at my table, with people new to the game, of course. First of all, D&D does not rely on mana. That's another product of video games. To be able to cast a spell, first, you have to have a spell or spells written in your spell book. When starting out, you only have what is called a traveling spell book. This is compact and fits into an inside pocket in your robes. Now with the use of right spell, which is on page 69 of the player's handbook, if you all look it up, or you can write or scribe it yourself. This is based on your intelligence score. Now, see the player's handbook again on page 10. Chance to know spells, which covers comprehension of how a spell works and your ability to understand how to cast it. Also, when you find a new spell, your intelligence determines how many spells of each level you have. 
and the ability to understand how to cast said spells. Now, I know someone who explained this in a very realistic way, but I'm just going to change around a little bit. Memorizing spells is like learning how to walk. All right? A magic user can memorize only a certain number of spells per level. This is how many steps you can take before you fall. At first level, you get one spell. At second level, you can memorize two first level spells. That's two different spells or the same one twice. Or the more steps you take, the more confident you feel that you don't need one of your parents holding your hand for you anymore. Now, once you cast a spell, it is forgotten until you memorize it again. Magic users don't get bonus spells for high intelligence like clerics do. This is because a cleric spells are based on higher wisdom. Because clerics are a support class they are supposed to use their bonus spells to heal the party and to keep the game progressing. Memorization can take quite a while. You must first rest for four hour minimum for a first level spell. And up to 12 hours for ninth level spells. After you've rested, then it takes 15 minutes per level of spell for each spell you memorize. So first level spell is 4 hours and 15 minutes. Second level spell, 4 hours and 30 minutes. Or two first level spells. A ninth level spell will take 14 hours and 15 minutes. Now that's all listed on the Dungeon Master's Guide on page 40. Number four, magic users have a well of hit points at their disposal. Yet again, Another example of video game misconception. As a matter of fact, magic users have the lowest hit points in the game. Their hit die is a 1d4 per level until 11th level. Now at 12th level and every level thereafter, they only get an additional hit point. Number five, invisible means I'm invisible. Most every player who has played a magic user and acquired the spell invisibility has fallen prey to not understanding how this second level spell works. Now again, this is the fault of video games. Under magic user spells in the player's handbook, it states, and I quote, invisibility, illusion, phantasm. It's a second level spell. Components, VSM, which means vision, somatic, or movement, material component, or region. Range, touch. Casting time, two segment duration, which is two rounds. Special saving throw, there is none. Area of effect is the creature touched. Now, explanation and description of the spell. This spell causes the recipient to vanish from sight and not to be detected by normal vision or even infravision. Of course, visible creature is not magically silenced with respect to noises normal to it. The spell remains in effect until it is magically broken or dispelled or the magic user or the recipient cancels it or until he, she, or it attacks another creature. Okay? Thus, the caster or recipient could open doors, talk, eat, climb stairs, etc. But, if any form of attack is made, the visible creature immediately becomes visible, although this will allow the first attack by the creature of the former invisibility. Even the allies of the spell recipient
cannot see the invisible creature or his, her, or its gear unless those allies can normally see invisible things or employ magic to do so. I'll note that all highly intelligent creatures with 10 or more hit die or levels of experience or the equivalent in intelligence, dice, and levels have the chance to automatically detect objects that are invisible. The material components of invisibility are an eyelash and a bit of gum arabic, the former encased in the latter. That's easy to understand, right? What most players don't take into consideration is a little thing called physics. And no matter how careful or stealthy you think you can move. Example, movement through an area covered by leaves. It disturbs the leaves. Movement through shallow water. Water displacement. Passing through dust on the ground. It'll cause dust clouds. Or going from a wet to dry area. Obviously, you'd have wet footprints on a dry surface. Your movement is obviously detected. Now, to counter this, it would require a spell like levitation along with invisibility. Now that can pose another set of problems when stacking spells. And most of the time requires more than one caster to pull this off. What do you think? Did I misrepresent any of these topics? Tell me below. I want to know. Until next time, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.